Good morning, today we are at St. Andrews International School for their very first competitive science fair. The purpose of the fair is to encourage the students from different international schools to think critically about science, to investigate their observations and hopefully come up with new ideas. It is also a great day for parents and students to get together and join in many scientific fun games. So let's go inside and see what our future scientists are up to. now with the principal of St. Andrews International School, Andy. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Andy, it's an exciting day. Tell us about this day. It's very exciting. Well, this is a day that's been brought together by the students uh, under the leadership of Nick Frost, the head of science. And what we're doing here is celebrating and getting very excited about science. We're taking it away from being something that happens in the classroom with textbooks and we're making it something that's very very hands-on such as water rockets understanding the pressure but at the same time understanding all the scientific principles to be able to make your rocket go up to 90 meters today we've seen the rockets go how long have they been working on this well this project today they literally come today they set it all up they make their water rockets they design them within a 15 minute time frame and then they fire them um, inside the exhibition where we have the competition pieces children have been working on those for two or three weeks to bring together their theory so there's very uh, lots of different theories in there somebody's uh, decided to wash hair with different types of shampoo and work out whether expensive shampoo is better than cheap shampoo other people have looked at pressure or changes of state or anything really within our science curriculum so basically they're taking the theories and then they're kind of like trying them out absolutely take take a theory test it and then work out what you learn from it because sometimes when you test a theory it goes exactly to plan and other times you learn a lot more because it didn't go to plan so a whole range along the way when they were learning the theories and you know deciding what they're gonna do with them have they come up with their own theories and ideas well that will be the next stage because this is the competition piece and this is like the platform from which then the children can take their ideas forward and instead of it being a two or three week project or as the water cannons are a 15 minute project we can then look at it in a, in a lot more detail but as you say you know science goes on forever it's a lifelong subject and when some of these students go on to degree level then hopefully they will be finding totally new things which maybe will help humanity and maybe help us in our future lives how many schools are participating uh, today we have three schools here we have the Regents International school and we have Garden International School and this is our first major fair then hopefully next year we'll invite uh, maybe four or five extra schools and then over the years hopefully build it up to be something that uh, Patia can be proud of for the whole of Thailand. Andre and Nick. Andre is a parent of one of the students at the St. Andrew's School and he's the one who donated the solar panel here. Hello Andre. Hi Sue. Hi. So uh, you donated this as an experiment for St. Andrew's School, is that right? Yes. yes. So what experiment are you looking into? Well, I want to promote the residential use of solar and at the same time show that you can actually grow plants underneath the solar plant which up to now is not common to do. Mm -hmm. So the school is supposed to have their biology department growing plants in the shade and in the sun with artificial irrigation, drip irrigation, which is pretty new to Thailand too. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly where we're standing now. It's supposed to be plants, right? Yeah. But they're not grown yet. They haven't gotten down to it yet, mm -hmm. but they will. And this, this was actually the idea of putting the solar panel a bit higher above the ground. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Normally, how, how high is it? Well, 
the big plants, they start at 80 centimeters and go up to 120, 140, and you can't grow anything underneath. Mm. And it's a waste of land, especially agricultural land. So that's why we put this up to show everybody that you can do actually more than just solar pa panels. Okay. Now tell us a little bit about the solar panels. We read about it, we know about it, but, but what is, how does it function? Solar panels are really simple. You catch the sunlight and you make electricity. You have a small inverter box, as you can see on the side here, which connects to the grid, to the electric system in the house, and you get electricity out of the sun. It's, it's really simple. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago the prices were really high, and now we're at a stage where prices are so low that you can actually get your money back in 10 years and then have electricity, electricity for free for the next 10, 15 years. Right. Now, so it pays off now. Yeah, it pays off eventually. Uh, the panel that we see here, how long does it hold? They are guaranteed for 25 years, mm -hmm. but every solar panel producer guarantees 25 years now. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter which one you take, they all guarantee 25 years mm -hmm. and they guarantee a maximum output of 80% of the original output after 25 years. Okay. Let's say during the day, how long can you use the electricity from this? This feeds directly into the grid. Mm. It means at noon you usually have the highest output and if you have an air condition you use up the electricity in your house so you don't need to store it. Mm. You just add to your grid that you have already and you save energy during the daytime when you have the highest output. Mm -hmm. If you don't have air condition, you don't really need solar mm -hmm. because storing it is just too expensive. Batteries are too expensive. Oh, okay. It's only worth it when you have air condition and when you have hot water. Okay, so it, it goes directly to the grid and you use it immediately, right? Yeah. So this is a, a parallel to the normal electricity that we are using and yes. it, it switches back and forth or what? The inverters automatically connect to the grid and feed the right hertz into the grid so there's no problem there you just hook it up you just connect it and it runs mm. there's nothing to do so when this one runs out it goes back to the normal thing. yeah right. when they don't produce enough energy the inverter shuts off and then you just use your normal electricity from the system okay that sounds simple enough and and um, cheap enough to do now coming to to nick here who's more on the market side of it do you think that it's going to take off in thailand i mean we have sun all year round i don't know why we don't do it Oh, for sure. I think um, within f five or ten years, I think we'll see like individual household. I think we'll see uh, most in the even housing project. I think uh, they'll probably have it up uh, with the with the project itself. I think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, five ten years. Five to ten years. Why does it take that long? It started twenty twenty five years ago, but it was experimental and it was so expensive. Yeah. It really takes off now with the overproduction and the prices halving every year. Mm -hmm. We now are at a stage where it's even with other electricity production. Okay. Basically, you're aiming at the at the private houses. Yeah. Photovoltaic is really made for residential. Mm -hmm. They are using large power plants now because of subsidies, but we will be able to supply electricity with no subsidies. Mm -hmm. If you do it at residential areas, you don't need fencing, you don't need land, you have your land already at home. Mm -hmm. If we do carports, what we start out with, you already have your cars parked so that it doesn't take up space. Mm -hmm. You don't need fencing, you don't need big power lines because you feed it directly into the existing grid. Mm -hmm. So all these expenses that you have with large power plants, you don't have with residential. Mm -hmm. It's just the price that has to be at a point where it's affordable for everybody. Right. And that's where we're at now. Right. But how big uh, is a panel for, for a private house? Well, we will be offering 3 kilowatt to 5 kilowatt plants. And they just take up a double carport size. Mm -hmm. Double carport produces 3 kilowatts and that's enough to run your air condition for 8 hours a day for your house and to produce hot water for your whole family to shower, to wash. So that's for eight hours running. Now for that, if you convert that into baht, how much would that be? All I can tell you right now is at four baht per kilowatt that you pay, you can pay off the system in less than 10 years okay. and then have free electricity for 10, 15, 20 years. We don't know the exact lifespan of panels yet. They guarantee 25 years, they might last 40 years. We don't know yet because they haven't been on the market that long.
it takes time to promote, to show people. That's why we put up this plant so everybody yeah. can come yeah. at St. Andrews, look at it, see it actually working. They can see on the internet what output they have so they can calculate for themselves mm -hmm. whether the numbers they get from the press are true or not. Mm -hmm. Everybody and if they're ready, they here. can just go ahead and, and get it from you guys? From you? Thanks. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Ready? yes. Yeah. I'm ready now. So here you go, uh, a lot of information here and they're all great information. It saves money in the long run. It makes sense. You can grow plants and flowers under the panels as well. So come around to St. Andrew's School and check it out. It will be here forever, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
standing with the teachers behind all the exciting experiments. Mr. Ed, hello. Hello. Uh, Shalom. Hello. Hi. All right. Tell us about the, the experiments that you prepared for the kids. Um, well, we just really wanted to show everyone who come today, um, a, a, you know, a few of the more interesting experiments they may or may not have seen before. Um, and we're fairly used to doing this kind of thing back in England. Um, but when we'd come here before, the, you know, it seems a lot of the kids hadn't really seen some of the practical. So we tried to come up with some of the better uh, bangs and flashes that we that we could. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, are you actually teaching some of that in your class? Yeah. So a lot of these experiments are based on things that we teach uh, all the way through the school. Um, for example, the the first things we did with all the colour changes, uh, that's just basic basic chemistry, basic chemical indicators, um, and then all the kind of bangs and flashes are all kind of big exothermic reactions. So again, that's stuff we teach them at GCSE. And uh, what do you expect out of this, these experiments from the students? Well, hopefully a bit more interest in science um, and a, a kind of willingness to take it on to, to the next level and maybe go on to sort of study the sciences, uh, sort of going on towards university and things like that. If you get them enthused and excited about stuff now, then you know, it, that will happen. Uh, and it's very important. Yeah. 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 I'm standing now with Nick Frost, the man behind the wonderful world of science at the St. Andrews. Hello, Nick. Hi, how are you? I'm oh, good, thank you. Nick, how long did you prepare for all this? Well, we came up with the uh, original idea in November, uh, so around about five months, and then over the last two or three months, the contributing schools have been preparing their exhibits and so forth for today. And uh, how many, you have sponsors as well, but we'll we, talk about them later. Let's talk about the students first. What do they have to show today? Oh, it's, it's really interesting. When you first come up with the idea, you wonder what the students can possibly come up with. Uh, but they've actually done a really good job. We've got people who've come up with checking out shoes to see if there's bacteria growing them. Even new ones, which uh, the public might find really bizarre, but even new shoes actually have a lot of bacteria growing in them. Uh, we've got other students who have uh, found out whether a fish will school in a certain number. We've had another boy who's designed and created a backpack that will charge your mobile phone. Um, and so endless number of exhibits, great, great, great imaginations. It's did you have exciting. to choose some of the items or did you bring all of them? No, we, we basically what the schools have done is sort of filter out ones they thought were very, very good and others which were a little bit project uh, based. So what we tried to do is we ran like a mini thing in each of the classes. They had to prepare their exhibit and then we decided if it was good enough to come into the VF. Fortunately, uh, most seem to be good enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so okay, we're going to walk around and uh, take a look at them later. Tell us about your sponsors. It seems that you have so many oh, people supporting the event. The, the, the number of sponsors is incredible and we, we've had, uh, if I go through them very quickly, we had Caterpillar, uh, Sodexo, Selamus Transport, PTT, uh, who have I missed? Uh, let me make sure I don't miss any from the Caterpillar. The Marriott, Rayong Marriott, the new hotel that's going to be opening in Rayong, and Galcom, Galcom Petroleum um, have all given a uh, prize very generously. Uh, and Sodexo even put on snacks and refreshments, which is good. And we have to, can't forget actually St Andrew's Group who, who provided the lunch today. So. Have you forgotten something? I haven't only not forgotten, let me think. Wait, wait. Uh, the only other people who are really important were Patia Mail TV because they actually have not only run articles for us, they actually came along and, uh, and made it much more exciting for the kids because, uh, to be honest, with the camera people here and things, the kids are much more excited. Um, uh, and the other things we have to thank is my science team uh, who, who ran a brilliant science challenge this morning and put on an incredible science show uh, to show just what science can be like. And that was Ed Thorpe and Charlotte Harris, just amazing, amazing. So besides uh, the whole year of teaching all these science exciting experiments to the students, I hear that you're going to have a oh, summer camp as well? How can, we, how can we possibly forget my <laughs> summer camp along with Mr. Emery? Uh, every year we run this and uh, this year uh, we are going to be running again where the students get to go snorkeling, uh, mountain biking, uh, fishing, uh, they're going to get to go to uh, the movies, they're going to get to go windsurfing, uh, endless number of activities, horse riding, golf, just awesome, awesome two weeks, awesome two weeks. Fun. Those who are interested should come and to the school or, yes, or they what they come can to the school or you just ring the school and uh, ask to speak to uh, Nick Frost or Andrew Emery. It's uh, be wonderful to have you. You won't be sorry, by the way, boys and girls. It's the the place to be. And parents, you know it's right because then you don't have the students annoying you for two weeks. They're with us. They come home tired. 
it's a no-brainer, send them to us. Right, and then the parents can go on their honeymoon again. For right sure, now. for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty and my own So, Abby, you're from Garden International School. Yes. You brought a chromatography display investigation for us. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yes. So, I made this chromatography, and my aim was to increase the speed and to, she to show the flexibility in chromatography. And so, I've shown the different types of chromatography. Like this one over here is thin layer chromatography. And what's inside that jar? Inside the jar is a layer coated with silicon, and on top of it is ink which is put in a solvent, which is ethyl acetone. And uh, then the spots over at the bottom move up, separating the colors in the process. Over here, I've got an iodine tank, which, is, which shows a pre-made layer. Pre-made, is that? Pre-made. Right. So it was already separated. Right. But after putting iodine in there, it actually sh re shows the spot. Right. Then and what about this? fancy piece of kit you've got here on the table? That's a column for a gas chromatograph. It is actually silicon coated and when a ink is put through it and then a solvent is put over, it separates through high speed and the detector shows that if a color is separated or not. Okay, now we have uh, Matt and CJ from St. Andrews. They've got something about keeping beetles in the dark. Matt? Yes, so we're doing a research on light preferences of, among the beetle larvae. We use a green filter paper and a blue filter to um, make a light effect, um, green light and blue light. Once we got the tank set up, we put the larvae in the middle and see which way they go. And we leave it for 10 minutes and we search for the beetle and we do um, a table and create a pie chart. And what did you discover? Is there a light preference, CJ? Uh, they are more likely to go to the dark side of the tank because that's how they, that's the results, that's what the results show. It was just the light side or the dark side? Did the color make a difference, the green or the blue? The color does actually make that difference because um, green are more actually shinier than blue. So that's because in the nature, the mother would lay an egg like 30 centimeter deep. That's why um, the beetles aren't um, adapted to the light color. So they prefer a darker light. A darker light. So here we have Nicole with her eye-opening investigation. Tell us a little bit about this, please, Nicole. Um, well, I tested how the eye changes looking to different colors. I first got um, the eye before without looking at anything, and it shows on the graph how um, the average is about 0 0.2. But as soon as I gave them a picture to look at, it dramatically changed. Um, for the, uh, I tested guys with a girl's picture, but they didn't seem to enjoy it as much, apparently, so their pupil didn't change as much. But with the girls, I tested it with a man picture, and they really enjoyed it, so their pupil got up way above one, um, one centimeter cubed. So if they saw a baby, their pupil got bigger because it was sweet and really calm. But when they saw red, um, their pupil got really small because they were like, whoa, what's happening? And it's like, a, it's like mind-blowing to see in your face. Um, what I have investigated, that it shows that when you see something you enjoy, your pupils grow. And if you see something shocking, or something that you dislike, it will grow, it will go less. That's cool. So you found out. So something about desire. Yeah. Something about enjoyment gives you a wider pupil. That's what I think. Did, and it happened more with girls than with boys? Yes, it did. It's very interesting. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. Okay.
Um, here we have Ninka, Sarah and Bella from St Andrew's School. They've got an electric uh, wind power demonstration going on. Ladies, tell us a bit about this. Who built this fan here? Who built the coloured fans? Um, well, actually, this is the science department, but we were allowed to borrow them. And um, this is a motor, which is attached to a clamp stand. And we built uh, a little house around it to make it look more like a windmill. And what made you decide on the size of the paddles for the blades? Um, because we wanted to see which one goes quicker, like which one's best for a fan or a windmill. The one that goes fastest is the small blades and the big blades together. Small blades and big blades together. And have you got a reason why more blades means more turning? Well, if it's a real life one, they can only use three blades because if they have more, it will be it will go slower because it's heavier and it will cost more. And yours turns faster with more blades. Yeah, but the blades are lighter, which means it and like, which means it will create, it will go faster because they're light. But the real life ones are heavy, which might might slow them down. That's why they use less use less blades. Okay, and you're drawing. What sort of currents? What does your meter register when the fan is on? Uh, millivolts. It's measured in millivolts. And have you tried to power anything with your fan? Have you tried a light bulb yeah. or a buzzer or anything? Yeah, we tried a light bulb, but it didn't light up because there wasn't a lo enough electricity to make it light up. And have you visited any real-life windmills, some proper electricity-generating windmills? Well, I, I'm in, I live in Holland, and so <laughs> I've been in one, inside one. Are you a fan of this method of producing electricity? Yes. I like you all for it? Do you think there should be more wind power? Yes. What, what's the problem with wind power? If you're going to rely on wind power to produce, produce your electricity, what's the problem with using wind power? Because there's not always wind that can produce the electricity. So we'd need backup, shouldn't we? We'd need something else. All right, excellent. Thank you girls very much. Okay, here we have Pierre and Bobby. They have a, a hovercraft investigation going off, and I think it's actually going to pick up one of the designers. Okay, this is 51 kg hardcore. It floats minimum. This is the minimum speed. Okay. Maximum speed. What is this? Is this sunscreen material? Um, this is, yeah, it's suns, what you said. It's just a sheet of plastic. And is the air coming through every single little hole? Are these guidance? What? Only, these are guidances, yeah. They just blow out these ways. They all blow out and they slowly lift the hovercraft up. So how many people have you had on this now? Um, more than we can count. 50, 100, 200? Well, uh, about 50 or so. 8 million? No, not 8 million. But it's still working, yeah? It's still going. You must have made it very, very well. Congratulations, chaps. Thank you. Hi, this is Lottie from St Andrews. She's been investigating um, what we've been stepping into when we put our feet in our shoes. Lottie, how did you decide to investigate shoes? Well, I decided because... Uh, I decided to do this because it's really interesting and fun and I thought about this by myself and I thought that would be really interesting results so like um, how does shoes like uh, grow and stuff so I, I thought it would be a really fun experiment to do and I got really interesting like results um, this is a new shoe, a hold up this is a new shoe straight from the box yeah and it had more bacteria than a shoe that comes right from a display where people actually wore it walking around the store to try it on. So it's really weird, but it's probably because there's more moisture in the shoes. Uh, in the, not in the shoes, but like on the box and stuff that's trapped, so mold grows on it. I get this, then I just open it up, six and a half centimeters in, then just cover it up quickly, and then open it, this thing up, and then roll it on. 
and then you get results between a week, some like two days or a week, you have really interesting results. This one has grown about this much in one morning. Can you believe that? So much. That's the new shoe. Yeah, that's a new, this one, no, this one's not a new shoe, but this one has grown a lot too. Between two days, about this side has covered all up. That side. It's really interesting. I divided the shoes up into two categories, the sweaty shoes and the sweaty shoes. Um, the sweaty shoes are like used once a day, once in a few days, and the, and the sweaty shoes are used only like once a week or once in two weeks. So this one, the big boot, is used only like once a week or once in two weeks, and it's five to six years old, and it has the highest rate of bacteria in that category of sweaty shoes. And Again, my dad had this shoe, has the highest rate in the category that I put in as sweaty, sweatiest shoes. It's really interesting because how, like, it's, a, it's an unknown world to people, what's in the shoes. And I thought it's just amazing to have a look at it. It's icky and gross, but it's just amazing to see it all. So how many pairs of shoes do you own? Um, at home I own ten pairs, five pairs. Did you test any of your own shoes? Uh, yes, I did. This is um, my shoe. It had, it was, th it was the third most bacteria in the category sweatiest shoes. I'll hold it up. I had to put it in Foley because it was a toxic hazard. The bacteria in it has a hazard to be toxic, so you can't breathe it in. So I had to. Get it. So whose shoe is worst, yours or your dad's? Um, my dad's. <laughs> Shame. And how are you going to dispose of the plates? Um, I think maybe bleach or like burning it will be um, how we're going to do it. Cool, very interesting. Thank you very much, Lottie. Today is about lighting up fire of interest in science. For some of the older generations around here, we didn't have science taught in this manner. We had it taught in a very, very different manner, and it wasn't something to get too excited about. Hopefully for your generation and future generations, science will be known as a very exciting area of interest that you can really develop, not only at school, but in your future lives. So I will agree with Mr. Frost, some fantastic ideas, some fantastic experiments, and we will in time try and write them all up so other people can join in with your knowledge. But more than anything, if today spark the fire, keep that inquiry mind going so that you can take some of these ideas further or share them with other people. Who are the monsters in our shoes? Oh.